Let's get going. Welcome to CS Online, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew Marks, co-founder of Success Hacker and our success coaching training program. We're back for our monthly live webcast today talking about moving from reactive to proactive active engagement with your customers. Um, before we get started, we'd like, oh, we don't have chat. There we go. Chat's now running. Awesome. Good. Before we get started, uh, yes, Darcia, the, this session is recorded. We record these sessions and post them on uh, uh, on, on the website. So, so go ahead and sit and hit OK, and you'll be good. Uh, before we get started, we'd like to run a quick poll about the frequency of these events. So Ashley is going to drop a link in chat, and we'd appreciate all of you responding. Um, we're trying to decide how often we're going to be running these events. So definitely would appreciate it if you would uh, if you would uh, respond to this uh, to this poll. Ashley, you can drop that in chat now. There it is. Awesome. This free learning event is bought, brought to you by Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training with nearly 17,000 students in, from more than 17 countries on our platform. Our training programs are available in a variety of formats from self-paced online learning to virtual instructor-led boot camps. We're now accepting registrations for our fall 12-week live coaching programs being offered under the University of San Francisco School of Management. Uh, we also have a number of standalone courses taught by industry experts, including data-driven decision-making, having difficult conversations, change management for customer success, uh, outcome-based selling, and what successful managers do, our management training and coaching program for those looking to get into leadership roles. Find out more at successcoaching.co. Ashley will also drop the link into chat. For those of you who haven't participated in one of these events before, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success. Regardless of the company that you work for, the scope of your role, or the sizes of the customers that you deal with, we aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. The schedule for our upcoming events can also be found at successcoaching.co. Just click on the events tab at the top of the page to find out more. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is recorded and we'll be posting a replay along with a transcription on our website early next week. We will be taking questions later on during the webinar, so please don't be shy and use those Q&A buttons found at the bottom of your screen to ask or upload a question we're also broadcasting on LinkedIn Live and have someone that's monitoring that feed. So if you have questions and you're watching on LinkedIn Live, please post them and they'll be relayed to us. Also, please keep all commentary to the chat window. There's a lot of thought leadership out there along with a lot of theories about how to deliver customer success. In this series, we focus on practical, real world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those practicing customer success on a daily basis. To do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft and we ask them to share their experiences and their perspectives. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do. Let's get started as usual in alphabetical order with Ali. The reason I love my name starting with A. So I'm Allie. I am a senior consultant at NCloud. I come from a customer service, switched over, transitioned over to a customer success background, starting with a B2B manufacturing background and then hitting the glass ceiling in the customer service and pushing my, my role into being more customer success, which for me at the time in 2015, that meant being more proactive and really making sure my customers were happy with the product they received. And at that time, it was a physical product. And then I went into the tech industry with a B2B digital advertising company. And now I am working with NCloud, a customer or partnership with Gainsight. And we help people, companies implement Gainsight and work with their different projects, with their CRM systems, along with their strategies and their customer success teams. So excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Ali. Great to have you here. You know, a, a question that I'm going to be asking actually in a webinar, a special webinar we're going to have next month 
uh, is uh, is customer success, customer service 2.0. Right? There's a oh, lot wow. of these principles that uh, and and skills that are uh, applicable to both. So um, I'll hold my thoughts for that webinar. Okay. Andrew, and- We'll love be, to be a panelist. <laughs> we'll be posting uh, posting that on the website in the next few days. Uh, but I've got a great uh, panel of guests already lined up for it. Uh, but thanks, Ali. Appreciate you you joining us, Jeremy. You're up. Yeah. Well, and like uh, the middle child that I am, I'm usually never first, but I'm usually never last. So um, you know that's uh, how that goes. But um, yeah, Jeremy Donaldson. I don't think uh, there's quite a few people on this call that already know who I am. But I am a team lead for customer success here at Tatango. Um, and I, I joined about eight months ago to just accelerate my passion for helping organizations deliver customer success um, even stronger and more pointed for, for what they do. Uh, on, on a personal mm-hmm. note, what you, uh, what you will not get interrupted with today is normally my kids love to show up anytime my camera's on. So uh, unfortunately, for those of you who showed up to see my kids as they normally do when I've been a part of you know, things like Gangrel Retains Office Hours and stuff like that. They will not be here today, uh, unfortunately, but um, I, it's it's good to be a part of this and good to be back, um, especially uh, having just done one back in the fall with you all. Um, so it's good to good to be uh, a part of the discussion. I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing thoughts from the community around this topic of, of proactive versus reactive and learning from Ali and Keishla today. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, we got a we got a full dose of uh, Jeremy's kids uh, during the prep call on uh, on Monday. But I think uh, I think at this point, everybody is 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 somewhat used to kids, spouses, animals crawling on, on your keyboard. You know, that's kind of been our life for the for the last few years. So uh, and Jeremy, it's great to see you. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, you were on the previous in, in the fall, but uh, I haven't I, I have not had the bandwidth to join the uh, the GGR calls, although I am, I believe I'm, I'm hosting one here uh, coming up uh, in, in between coaching cohorts, I believe in, in late August, early September. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting back uh, and connected with the community, uh, the GGR community. Um, and, and finally, last but not least, uh, Kishla. Hi, everybody. My name is Keishla Caesar Jones. I respond to pronouns as she and her. And, and I'm going to take a little backward stance um, is to let you know my career success in success has its roots in sales and sales management. I worked in uh, the B2C industries. I shifted and I was an educator in the K-12 classroom for about a decade. And the last 10 years, I've worked in the ed tech space at the intersection of sales, success, product, and marketing with a focus on supporting partners in elevating um, and evaluating and selecting and implementing SaaS products to achieve their goals and have an impact. And so I currently serve as the Senior Director for Partner Success over our digital experience teams at EAB, um, which focuses on higher ed uh, market for the most part. And I serve over our two teams that focus on our virtual tour and our virtual communities platforms. I am excited to be a part of this customer success community that um, spans a lot of different spaces. You're always so giving and and supportive and, um, you know, excited to be here, be a part of this conversation. Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're, we're happy that you're here. And like we talked about in the prep call, Keisha, I love your story of being an educator and moving into customer success. We, as, as we discussed on Monday, uh, I think educators, teachers uh, make great candidates for customer success managers. You have to just have just immense patience and you need to be able to sometimes break down complex situations into uh easier to digest chunks and uh uh yeah there's so many and i and i I, we've definitely seen an influx of of folks especially in our training program that come from the education come from an education background want to get into customer success so that's that's awesome i appreciate uh you Um, as well we and i appreciate everybody here uh spending our the time today uh with us as well as our prep call on monday um so I'm going to ask one more time. We've got uh, 75 responses for that uh, for that poll that we did. I'm going to ask Ashley to drop it one more time. If you have not answered our poll about the frequency that we have these CSMMs, I would appreciate it if you would answer. We're trying to make some decisions on on how often uh, we're going to have these um, and weigh that against our other uh, webinars that we do. So let's get uh, now. Let's get to the topic at hand. Um, 
proactive engagement can be an incredibly powerful tool to increase the quantity and quality of customer interactions across the entire customer journey. Shifting from uh, a reactive engagement strategy to a more proactive strategy leads to more valuable customer interactions, more value delivered, more opportunities to deliver additional value, higher customer satisfaction, and higher customer lifetime value, which is what we are all here to do. We play the long game, right? It's all about keeping our customers, keeping them as long as possible. But shifting from reactive to proactive can be challenging. There are always going to be some reactive engagement required in any customer-facing role. So where do you begin trying to move to a more proactive engagement strategy? Yeah, so so Andrew, this is I love this topic, and actually, uh, for those of you who saw my post earlier in this week about doing what could one thing that you could be doing in your role to become more proactive, I actually posted a poll, um, thinking that this would actually be a really cl- like a really clear answer, you know, one thing or another. And as the as the results of the poll actually show, um, uh, there's every when it comes to being proactive, there's so much that's intertwined as a part of doing that. Uh, you know, it. it takes a lot of different things from you know, starting with having a clear understanding of what are we actually supposed to do as customer success manager. And I believe that right, I've been in these roles before where the lines blur between, you know, what am I doing as a CSM and what are other roles in the organization supposed to be doing and delivering as a part of that customer journey. So um, the ability to get more proactive and being focused on the things, right, starts there, I think, where, you know, that response, having clear responsibilities and knowing what, what is the path I'm supposed to be taking my customers on, uh, which would then allow me to understand is the data that we're looking at in alignment with the responsibilities that I have. And then is the time I'm spending with my customers on those activities revolving around the data that I have access to and the responsibilities that I'm supposed to be delivering on, right, do all of those things. Um, are those all in alignment? And be, depending on where your company is and what you're doing within your role, right, that can get really hard to like cut, you know, cut through the noise that's there um, and actually get to that core piece. But uh, I thought it was really interesting that the results, there wasn't one thing that somebody, you know, called out and said, this is what you need to do. And this is the silver bullet to being more proactive. It's actually a combination of really getting clear on what, what it is that you should be doing, how you're spending the time, and then how are you using the data you have access to um, to help you, you know, really focus your efforts on the right things. But I would be curious from the group here on the, on the call um, if you would agree or disagree with, you know, what the kind of larger CS community is saying around this. So, Jeremy, I love, I love that poll and the idea, and I think it is a very interesting result that there are so many intertwining areas of customer success to, to make you proactive in that, in this industry with your customers. The one key word that I heard is, you know, is clarity, having that clarity. And I think the more that I work with different types of customers, you know, from ed tech to, I mean, you know, man, different management systems, clarity is the one piece that you have almost have to have in order to move forward and change your route from, you know, answering questions, putting out fires into then making your customers more successful in whichever their goals are. And that comes down from, you know, role clarity. What is ultimately, are you in, you know, implementation CSM, a onboarding CSM, you know, standard CSM. So that clarity of what your goal is with your customer, but then the clarity around their goals, the clarity around their data, the, your product, and having a clear understanding and always asking questions about those things so you get better understanding and then using that to push your customers to a more successful, to, to their goals. Yeah, I think, um, you know, to, to piggyback on that, that Ali, is that to me, the first point of clarity you need to have is, is what you're doing in the market, the customer that you're serving. And if you don't fully understand the problem that you're helping them solve or the, the, the situation or challenge that you're trying to help them overcome, um, you can find yourself doing a lot of things, sort of fill the gaps, but don't necessarily get at the heart of what it is. And so one of the things that we've been working to do is to make sure we understand what our customer cycle is. Oftentimes we do things based on our cycles, our business cycle. 
And and the talent of a CS a manager, I had a, a, a CSM that I worked with um, a couple of years ago, and, and we were always on this journey of sort of balancing the ability to understand the customer's needs and understand the business needs and create alignment between those things. And so the whole um, effort of proactivity is, is how we manage time. That's the one, the, the finite thing that we're all dealing with. And we can get more time when we get better at understanding what things need to happen when, who needs to be doing them. Um, and so you have to create opportunities for yourself to get upstream of the particular situation. So for all my former educators in the classroom, um, we've, we've all been in this space. Um, when I taught in the classroom, we get the school year would start and, you know, we do a day or so of getting to know you and class rules. And then we're right into the content. And then three, four months later to, you know, a couple of weeks in, six weeks in, we're dealing with behaviors or different challenges that we did not anticipate because we didn't do anything to set the stage for how we want that our class to function in that way. And so when I was in the classroom, I did that for a couple of years and I was that. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to take the first two, three weeks of school and I'm not going to do anything but do, do skills. I'm going to focus on skills, strategies, practices. And I bought myself that time later because I wasn't having to come back and revisit them because I created a good foundation. And I think in customer success, we have to do that same work of understanding what are the right foundations and expectations we need to set for our partners that we engage with that then allow us to leapfrog faster um, as as we move forward in our in our processes and working with them. Yeah, so I'm hearing I'm hearing a lot about. I mean, the the end goal is the end goal is well, actually, I I hear a lot about hear a lot of clarity, right? And it's all about clarity, right? It's it's clarity of your role, it's clarity of your of your product, it's customer clarity, as you said, uh, it's it's understanding your data. Uh, and 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 the better we can control, the uh, better we can understand that, the more likely we are to be able to manage our time effectively. Because it's it's almost like, okay. We that's the prerequisite. We need to be clear on what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to help our customers to achieve, and then and then the then we need to focus on the time management aspect of this to free up the time. Uh, to 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 allow us to become more proactive, and I, I've I've talked many times about how uh, uh, you are in charge of your schedule. You need to control your schedule. Nobody else does, right? So I hear all the time, and I talk to lots of CSNs in various stages of their career. I don't have enough time. I, I get it. Time is a finite resource, but but that's kind of part of the effort. Is you need to you need to prioritize and you need to control your time. Nobody else controls your time for you. Um, so what are some of the benefits that you have experienced that you've seen from utilizing a more proactive approach with your customers? Any, any, uh, um, stories, any, uh, uh, experiences that you want to share about, about the goodness that comes out of being more proactive? So. I'll kick this one off. Um, the benefits that I've really received, and as cheesy as it sounds, is that being um, the customer seeing your value, and then in turn seeing the value of your product and your company, and wanting to keep coming back to you and renewing. And the ultimate goal that we all have is having the customer keep coming back. But my thing, and I think one of the reasons I got into customer success is I love educating people on whatever topic I'm talking about and seeing that light bulb moment. And so when you can become proactive with, you know, kind of taking it back to like the clarity, if you have an understanding of your company, your, your goals within the company, your customer's goals, and then you're able to bring those two together and make, offer a suggestion, make an idea, train them on something they didn't know, be that pro, you know, move, take that proactive action. Them having that light bulb moment is that true, you know, subjective value that they are going to see and want to keep coming back. I mean, it happens in training the most, and I probably in, I never taught in the classroom, but probably you know, like in teaching, when you have a student make that value. But it's reasons why customers will come back back to you. I think. 
I love those light bulb moments when you just see it in their eyes. Oh, I get it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see the va- I, I, I get the value. I'm going to lead you down the path and you're going to finally get a click. Right? And then, and then you become, then you become that much more valuable to them. Right. Hey, this person understands my business. This person is proactively suggesting things to me that could help me extract additional value out of what we're doing because they understand my business. They understand their, their product and they've helped connect the dots between what they do and how that's going to have a positive impact on, on what we need. I love, I love that comment about connecting the dots, right? That's actually really like, if you think about being proactive, it's about taking, it's, it's taking the where, where we've been, where we are and tying it to where we're going, right? It's really about getting out in front and understanding. And I want to, I want to highlight something that Ali said too, right? About understanding, you know, it is a subjective value, right? Every customer's value of your product is it, while it might be solving a similar problem, the outcome that they're looking for is going to be vastly different, right? From a small company to a large, to a large enterprise. And understanding what that value and what that objective is, is what's truly going to help you focus your, your activities and get proactive on those things. If you don't know what's important to your customer, if you don't understand what that value is for your customer, how can you be proactive? You're going to be constantly reacting to the technical issues that are coming in or the bug fixes or the enhancement requests, or I just got this project dumped on me by, you know, my board of directors and I need to solve it right now. Versus I know that you're, you know, you're working towards, you know, growing your company to 120% net revenue retention, right? If you know that that's the underlying goal, how does your platform enable the company to move faster, more efficiently, get more data visibility, whatever it is you do, right? Can you tie it to something that impacts the company as a whole? Because that's when, you know, not only does your product become stickier, but then you, it gives you the license to be able to ask more proactive things about like what are going to prevent us from getting to 120% net revenue, right? And how does our, how does our technology, right? And our process that we're working towards, how does that tie into actually benefiting that? Because if you can do that, you just help those people you're working with get promoted, right? You just help those people have a roadmap to accelerate their careers, not only making the business successful, but helping the people you're working with successful as well. So um, I, I love that, like connecting the dots, right? Because if you can do that really well, you're going to, you're going to crush it as a CSM, wherever you are. Yeah, Jeremy, I think that a really big part of what we do as CSMs is change management. And obviously, you know, across organizations, what it, it's, it's hard to sort of paint CSM with a broad brush because we understand that, you know, as, as Ali said, you might be an implementation CSM or you might be one that's responsible for revenue and retention. Um, and so depending on what your structure is, ultimately, um, you know, from if we're taking it from a consultative space, we're often the people that are helping to break down silos within their own organization helping them connect dots of how a particular tool works and, and, you know, in concert with other things that they're doing. And so being proactive, I think, is number one, understanding what your product does, understanding how it serves the particular goals. And we, and we always have to be super thoughtful that we, we can ask our partner, like, what are your goals? And not every goal that they lay out, my product might not serve. So it's really important that I understand where my product is going to serve them in their goals and, and be that builder because we could also put our paint ourselves into a corner that we we latched ourselves onto a goal that that we don't have the ability to impact and make change. And earlier in the conversation, I think um, Andrew, you floated, you know, is customer success, customer service 2.0. And I think that depending on how your teams are constructed, you're always doing elements of service, support, and success. I always like to say, you know, customer support, you know, is around those technical issues, those bug fixes, and hopefully you are at a point where you can stand up a team to really be managing those. So you're not having to have the the gear shifting happening between different functions throughout your day as a CSM service is what, what can I do for you? But success is what I can help you do for yourself. And it's the work that happens when we're not there and how do we help stand them up? And the only way that you can get to that is to proactively lay out what you, what you understand about the partner, their business, their journey and then start to build resources. So, Andrew, while I agree with you as a CSM, um, you know, your, your time is your own. It's your sort of mini business. As CS leaders, it's our job to equip our teams 
with tools that allow them to do things at scale and not one-to-one. And so we're here to kind of help, you know, with seeing bigger playbooks, understanding trends and getting you ahead of it, as well as empowering our CSMs to be able to make decisions in the moment that are sort of in their framework. So I see there's a kind of a big question around like, how do you manage around rapid growth and, and, and managing to scale? And so I think that's where your leadership steps in to help you say, here are some best practices around managing your day. Here are some tools to help you do that thing, but do that instead for 20 customers instead of one at a time. So I think that's that's a big part of the proactive work as well. I, I love that. What, what can I help you do for yourself? I love the way you put that. that that's, that's great. But I heard a lot of great stuff there. You know, it, it, use the term, Jeremy, that, I, that I, I love to use when connecting the dots. As a matter of fact, you rattle off so many concepts that are already, I have, I have a, 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 a one of our training modules on the platform is all, all about connecting the dots, right? It's all about trying to connect the dots between what, what we have to provide and how the customer is going to get value out of it and, 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 and what, what role that plays in achieving overall corporate objectives. But the more proactive we are, the more questions that we ask, uh, the more likely we are to be able to expose those connections. And, and to your point, Kishla, um, uh, not every objective they have is necessarily going to be solved by you, but that's part of your part of your challenge is to figure out, okay, what are the things that you are being measured by that we can have a positive impact on? Right? That's that that's it, that's it right there. Right? Because companies don't spend money just to spend money, right? They are spending money, key, key stakeholders are investing in whatever you have to offer because they're expecting some sort of return on their investment. And that return is likely tied to one of their objectives, mm-hmm. which is which is likely tied to an overall corporate objective. And if you can connect the dots between those things, right, you make for a very powerful connection with the stakeholder, but more importantly, with the company. I had a discussion. Uh, I, I had a discussion uh, yesterday with with somebody talking about how uh, you can never. Um, and it was based off of a of a LinkedIn post that somebody had posted. I forget who it was, uh, but um, uh, there there's there's acceptable churn and then there's non acceptable churn, and, uh, uh, and and it was related to this concept of if the company gets acquired. Uh, then acceptable churn is the the acquiring company replacing the systems, and uh, and I and I I uh, I push back on that. If you've done a good job connecting the dots, and you and and you've got a, done a good job of communicating and and, and educating the key stakeholders uh, around those connected dots and how they've had an effect on their performance, you're in a much better position. You don't. You don't completely eradicate the risk of that happening, but you're in a much better position to have people within that company say, hey, one of the reasons why you bought us was because we offer the strategic advantage. Well, this partner of ours is, is part of us getting there. By the way, as a reminder, uh, Q, we're going to get into some questions in a moment. Um, if you want to ask a question or you up or you want to upvote one of the questions that's in the, uh, the Q&A section, this, is, this would be a great time for you to... Uh, uh, to put that out there before we uh, before we we start with questions. Um, so, what about uh, we talked about a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of themes here? Um, data is big these days. Everybody's talking about data driven decision making and leveraging data to uh, to to uh, to analyze your customer base, leading indicators, lagging indicators. How can we use uh, metrics and data and KPIs to be more proactive. You know, I've got thoughts on this, by the way, I'll, I'll go ahead and kick it off. I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm really setting the stage for Ali and Keishla to, you know, just drop, you know, they drop the mic. Uh, they've had just multiple mic drop moments already. So <laughs> uh, I'm sitting here just like, whoa, I, I don't know what I'm contributing to this, but you know, here we are. <laughs> so, um, but Keishla's the, the one getting a t-shirt made. <laughs> That's right. Yes, I'm excited. I'll be your I'll be your first customer, uh, Keisha, on that. So, um, you yeah, know, looking forward to that. But 
Um, I think as you think about data and right and making data driven decisions, if you and let's take I'm going to take this from the perspective of I am transitioning into being a CSM or I am a CSM right and I want to get more proactive and I don't have a lot of tools that are helping me do this. I think data driven decisions right is is that's where I would say a lot of that automation is right. Are there repeatable parts of your business? And Keisha touched on this a little bit earlier and what she was talking about. Are there repeatable parts of your business? That you can automate so that you as a you know frontline person with your customers aren't spending the time on the things that you know you a system can drive for you based on behaviors or based on how your your you know your users are using your tool or where they are in their customer journey, right? And so that you as a CSM or a CS leader can be focusing your efforts on the things that re- I actually think require a human touch. And I, I think in for customer success, whether CSM or the broader picture. You're never going to remove the the human element of customer success. It will always exist, even even in a digital model. Somebody has to build those journeys. Somebody has to build that automation, right? Even if they're not talking with the customers directly, that human element is always going to exist and needs to exist because we're relational people. So thinking about like what are the things that you could do, right? And if you don't have a tool, uh, what are the things that you could craft templates for that when customers are asking you repeat repeatable questions that you can deliver information back to them in a repeatable way that you're not spending tons and tons of cycles, right? Um, and, and doing that. If you do have tools that you can help automate that, right? What's missing, right? And what's that one thing that could, you know, save you an hour, two hours, right? You don't start with everything, right? Pick the one thing that comes up the most, try to solve for that for your customers, whether it's with yourself or with the broader team and, and go from there. But um, I think from a CSM perspective, and I, and I was here, right? I was a CSM that didn't have tools and, and ha- was having to do all this work manually. And it would just, over time, I just cre- started creating templates for myself that I use with, with customers. And now there's so much technology, including free technology and platforms, right? That you can bring those templates in a way that you can drive based on, you know, the behaviors, the questions, and actually start getting out in front of those customer requests um, in that regard. So you know, but data is extremely important. If you're making decisions without data, you're flying blind. And if you're waiting too long on data, right, you're missing the boat, right? It's finding that striking that balance between the two of them. So, but I know that Ali and Keisha got more on this because this came up in our prep call earlier this week around data. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to the, the two of them. Keisha, I don't know. Do you want to go? Okay. So I was going to say, Jeremy, you touched on a couple of things that are very, are, I'm passionate about, I will say. Um, but data, like you said, data is really, if you can use that to help automate, to save yourself time in any way, it's, oh, you know, it's going to help you in the long run, especially when you're having you, if you have a large book of business because of, you know, maybe lack of you're growing your team, but your company is growing faster than your team is. So if you can use that data to really automate things, that's going to be, you know, way better. But also in the note of data, if you can then, like teams, your your company is always going to have the goals and expectations that they want to, to see what the data is. But if you can make your own personal interpretations of the data that you think the customer is like, if you're, for example, let me back up just a second. If you look at the data as if you're the customer looking at the data and trying Mm. to make those interpretations, coming to the customer then with questions about the data, showing them, you know, a graph of maybe login trends. And you're saying, well, you know, I see this was a really high week over, you know, here, what, you know, asking questions, Mm -hmm. what were you expecting? You know, did you expect this to happen? What could this, what could have caused this? And then how can we replicate that? So you keep having those periods of high logins. So I always think looking at the data, especially with a customer that you're trying to really move into being proactive with, looking at it from the customer's point of view, making your own interpretations and then asking them and starting that conversation can help push you to get ideas of how to move into that more proactive relationship with that customer. So I completely agree on the automation and then that manual part is also going to be a really key piece of inter- how you interpret it. Yeah, all, all really good points. I think when I, I think about data, I think about it from two perspectives. I think there's the data that is generated from your partner's use of the tool, right? Um, and I think it's if, you're, if your organization hasn't done it, um, it's really important that 
as much of that data as possible that is useful is visible to the to the partner. Like we we should not be the holders and the keepers of data. We need to create an environment where where that data is self service to the partner. So one on one of my teams, we're working on. We just got some new data dashboards and visualization. So we've been training our our partners on how to read that data and what insights look like, like what is the what about this data visualization and what's the why? Why does it matter? And what then are the things you should be thinking about to go do to either say, to Ali's point, your data spiked. You did this thing, do more of that. The data's down. You, you didn't do this thing. How about we revisit this? And so we've been working to, number one, um, I always tell my team, let's not get emotional about the data. We're not here to judge it. Data is. Um, and data, we use it to inform what we want to do next. And so it's either that we need to course correct or we want to keep moving in a particular direction. So I think that there's that customer facing data that you have and you want to make sure they feel empowered and we're working to leverage um, our customer education spaces, whether that be through articles or videos to link back to, you know, if you're seeing this trend or that trend, here are some things that you can go do um, to be able to continue to move forward in a positive direction. So there's that. And then I think there's the data that you know about your business that helps to inform your staffing models, you know, or any um, decisions that you might be making. So um, I think sometimes we really focus on the product usage data and, and we can get better at asking about some of those internal things of, okay, so we had a year and let's look at the likelihood of a partner to renew based on whether or not we met with them quarterly, monthly, mm -hmm. Twice, you know, like, is, is there an influence to that? Is there an influence of, of partners who used a particular feature more than others and their likelihood to renew? What is sort of driving those decisions? And that can then help us to really focus our efforts in some particular ways. So I think it's a really a good balance of both the external data and the internal data um, to help drive us. And then how do we empower our partners to be owners of that? Oftentimes, you know, I've sat in a ton of QBRs where it's very presentational. We're and we're trying to tell you how to feel about it instead of, hey, we, when we met last time, you said you were going to do X, Y, and Z. And these are the data metrics that might you know, be informed by that. And then what are other strategies or, or best practices that we know from our industry that could then go and influence that in a different way? So um, I think that looking at data from those two perspectives to inform our decisions, both from a partner perspective internally are, are really important. And one one last point, and all great all great perspectives on data. One last point that I want to reiterate, even though it wasn't uh, spoken out loud, is that um, you need to capture and analyze as much data as possible. Storage mm -hmm. is cheap, right? We won't we don't necessarily know what data we really need to analyze, right? So what we need what we need though is we need a large data set. And to be able to sit down, whether it's you using Excel and some pivot sheet, pivot pivot tables, and trying to trying to come up with some sort of patterns, or or using a data scientist. Hopefully, you know maybe you have a data scientist on staff that you can borrow and say, "Hey, listen, here's this tranche of data of our customers for the last six months, for the last year." Uh, you know, um, looking at that cust those customers from a number of different ways, number of different variables to see if there's something that we can uh, uh, ascertain from the data that we have. Because you don't know what you did, what, you know, you don't know where necessarily where to go and, and what data is valuable until you start kind of pouring through it, right? So there's this upfront effort where, and, and really it's an ongoing effort to take a look mm -hmm. at that data and con constantly be uh, uh, analyzing it and looking for patterns, super important. Andrew, before we, oh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, before we move on real quick. So I think one thing that I heard, like from what Keisha said and what you said, Andrew, is one, don't be afraid of the data. So what you said, like Keisha, like it's not emotional. Data is. And I want a t-shirt that says that data is <laughs> because that's exactly what it is. The data, I mean, whether it's trending down or trending up, it's not emotional. It, it is what it is. And don't, you can't be afraid of it. And then you can't be afraid of changing things that you've already made after you've analyzed more data. And that's number one with health scorecard. I mean, health scores and churn scores and everything like that is you got to analyze the data and then ch make changes to reflect where your data is going and what it says. So don't be afraid of it. It, it is. 
Data oh, is. <laughs> Welcome it. Embrace it. the data. Mm -hmm. Embrace yes. the data. We've been All working right. with uh, in a previous team that I was on and, and whatever it was, whether, and this is data forecasting, it's, you know, facts, not feelings. Like what are the facts? <laughs> I'm going to start a t-shirt company. Um, and so, you know, what are the facts? And then let's, let's kind of get that really clear. And oftentimes we're so busy trying to manage how we feel about things um, that we miss what, what things we should be having feelings about. Yeah. So, I used to coach my teams all the time. I'm like, uh, let's remove the emotion from this discussion, the emotion from this decision, and let's look at the data. What does the data tell us? Right. I, I love that. Facts, not feelings. All right, let's yeah. get to the question. So um, our first question comes from Nicole. Uh, Nicole, thank you for the question. Uh, what are best practices to being the uh, – what, what, what are best practices um, to begin the transition from reactive to proactive when customer ratios – don't currently support it. We experienced unprecedented growth and are now trying to be more strategic and thoughtful. Our books of business are large and being proactive with that many people is unrealistic. Where do we start first to make the biggest bang for the buck? And Kishla, it looks like you wanted to jump into this one first. So what have you got to say to Nicole? Yeah, I, 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 I joined an org that was experiencing unprecedented growth during the pandemic and very much they, this team did a great job of managing through change and chaos and unpredictability. And now we're, we are on a path to focus on sustainability and quality. And we first started with nailing down some core principles and that we wanted to make sure that everything that we were doing was putting our customer at the center of our work. We did an evaluation of the, the, the processes and practices that we were undertaking um, to determine what we needed to start, stop, continue. And then I think the other thing, obviously, because you know, revenue is, is always key. And, and, and until you sort of get that properly stabilized, we, we took a first um, approach at making sure we had good processes and practices and models, um, playbooks using our, our um, CSM tools to be able to make sure that we gave our team members really good expectations around managing their um, pending unit universe, you know, their, their revenue expectations. And we went from being, you know, sort of tracking behind um, in, in managing our revenue to really clearing up our backlog and, um, and shaping that. And so now that allows us to pick our heads up and now start to focus on the service models that we want to put in place. So I don't know what your particular situations are, Nicole, but I think it's, Number one, evaluate what you're doing. Keep what's good. If it's no longer serving you, as Ali said, let it go. Um, and and what are your what are your your um, what's your vision for sustainability and quality after you've gone through, you know, really strong growth? Awesome, um, Jeremy, Ali, anything to add? I've I, I've one one more to agree 100. Uh, percent That's the right approach, Kisla. Um, Nicole. Also, um, segmentation is your friend. Right. At the end of the day, while we want to treat all of our customers with the same amount of respect, we're going to treat our $100,000 a year customers, uh, put more focus and treat them differently than our $1,000 a year customers. Uh, so, uh, you know, that and that that may be your stopgap approach. Hey, we need to focus on the top tier of our books of business uh, because they uh, either contain the most uh, uh, revenue or, or potential for revenue. And I would look at not just who's at that top level right now but also and this is something i did with one of my uh one of my one of my customers uh zoom info um when when they were restructuring their 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 uh, uh customer success team is is uh think about segmentation not just from their current revenue but their potential right what is the potential revenue that we could get do we have a uh, uh an opportunity here where we've got 10 seats uh, but it could it, it very easily, if we do the right things, explode to 100 seats or 1,000 seats, right? So I would also add to that segmentation statement, Andrew, is also thinking about your, your business, depending on how it is from a use case perspective as well, because if you can group like partners together, you can start to scale the support tools and resources that you build. And so instead of making, um, you know, one of the, uh, another uh, uh, 
the difference between customizing and tailoring. If you have to customize everything you do for partners, that takes you a lot of time. But if you can buy a suit off the rack and just make some nips and tucks, it'll, it really allows you to scale your efforts a lot better. You don't, it, nothing, it doesn't all need to be bespoke. And I have experience, I personally have experience in, in more homogenous applications, CRM, for example, or accounting, as well as uh, 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 platforms. So business intelligence, analytics, where every single customer is using it differently. We still found ways to, to structure it in a scalable way. Mm-hmm. And, and Jeremy used the word scale uh, a few minutes ago. Scale is super important because it's you know, by, by implementing scale allows it frees people up to be able oh. to have those conversations and do all those other things, right? Right. It's it, we're not automating for the sake of automating because we don't want to talk to you. We're automating because, hey, if I'm doing the same thing more than once or twice a week with the same customer, you know, with 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 my customers, why am I using that time? And it, it doesn't have to be a system like Jerry mentioned. It could be a a Google doc that has a bunch of copy and a bunch of email copy that you would normally and then you're, it's copy paste tweak a little. Right. That's right. Still, it's still scale. Right. It helps you scale. So. Awesome. Keisha, if you could hit done on that question, we'll get to the next one. Uh, let's see. Keely uh, asks, Keely, thank you for the question. Keely asks, in CS, we're often, we often work as part of a team of departments. What would you suggest for opening up persuasive conversations between departments to promote a more <clears throat> widespread shift from reactive to proactive among the entire team? My experience has been that anyone with customer contact might have a piece of information that could be valuable in efforts to be proactive. Um, At times, it feels that none of these departments feel the value in sharing information in an effort to be proactive suggestions on how to convince them. Allie, looks like you want to jump in on this one out of the gate. So what have you got to say to Keely? Yes, I love this question, Keely, because this is a big part of customer success is working internally with multiple departments to ensure that your customer, you have all the tools for your customer to be successful. So it can be really hard when you're working with teams that potentially aren't sharing the information that you think you you need from them. And I would say a couple of things. One, be open with them as much as you can. So you share the information, you be, you know, adding to, emails, CCing those teams, letting them know what's going on, setting up one-on-ones, and you push for for yourself to share what information you have in turn to get them to help and share what information they have. Other conversations... I'm sorry to interrupt, but in that that particular case, I think it's it's also impossible, it's also important that you're sharing with them why. Right. Why that information is important, right? Attaching the value to that of, of that information. And the goals that you want to get out of that. So the why, but then I'm sharing this with you because ultimately I want to get them to do X, Y, Z. You know, this is based off of this initiative meeting that you're, you know, we had on Monday. I would like this customer, customer ABC to do this. And I think it can be done. Have you had any experience with that? Has the customer said anything to you about it? Can we, you know, what do you think about this data point? Do you think it, is proactive. So asking questions like that, you you know, almost that the key of treating people how you want to be treated, you know, you're doing the same thing. You want them to be proactive in sharing the information with you. So you have to do it almost first. And then opening the conversation of how do we get how do we get to be proactive so that we're not always setting off fires. And questions that you know I've asked my own internal departments is, you know, what is successful? How do we make this customer successful from your point of view? I think opening that, because if you're working with a product team, a um, professional services team, a support team, and you ask them how the customer is successful from their point of view, they're going to want to share with you because they have their own goals and they want those to feel important. You know, that's important to them. So my suggestion to you is really to treat them how you want to be treated. <laughs> Go, you know, almost overboard if you feel like, but schedule one-on-ones with them, share information, explain your goals and how you're going to do it, your plan of action, and then yeah. in turn, have them open to you. 
Allie, I, I love that kind of, I, I call the concept of extending the olive branch, right? But it's very much the, the, the position of don't expect somebody else to start doing what you expect them to doing first, right? It's a it's kind of con, same concept of leadership, right? It's if you want somebody to, you know, mimic or replicate something that you're doing, you got to show them how, what a good looks like first um, and extending that. So first off, I, I love that that concept. The other piece of it is don't go into this alone. Like if you feel like you're the only one in the organization that's trying to drive this change, right? Use the leadership that's above you to, to help you, right? Because I imagine, you know, if you work for anybody who has any sense to this and wants to get cross collaborative, they're going to support you in that and they're going to help advocate. Um, so one of the things, take a lesson from me and trying to force fit this. This is many years ago in my career. I wonder if he's out here on the call listening to this today, but um, you know, I got, I got called out for trying to bring people together, but I did it in a, I did it in the wrong way, which was I went against the political structure of the organization, right? Tried to form this unity outside of what existed, right? And it actually caused a lot of headaches for myself and it caused a lot of headaches for a lot of other people because we were trying to create a new process that didn't exist and couldn't necessarily be supported holistically based on the way that our company was structured. And so if I had gone to like my VP at the time and, and said, Hey, I really want to see this, right. And here's what, here's where I want to start in this process. He would have been on board from the, the second that I would have brought it up and he would have taken it to his peers and his leadership team and saying, Hey, we won't keep, here's what we want to do right? You know, Jeremy, Keishla, Ali, they're going to be the ones on the team that are really going to drive this from my team. Who do you think on your team would potentially be interested in, in helping own this project, right? And being able to move that forward. So it is very much leading by example, but also understand what, what is the political structure of your organization and, and do well to navigate on that because you're not going to make any friends if you try to go like try to navigate around it. Um, in fact, you're going to make your life probably more miserable. Um, and trying to be more proactive from your customers if you go around that. But if you can navigate that well and get out in front of that, um, you actually, uh, I think you actually will come out ahead, uh, right? And you will, um, by showing them the value of like, I will stop asking you these questions over and over again, because we're now more tightly aligned. And I know what you're trying to get out of it. You know what I'm trying to get out of it. So anyway, that's all I really want to add from personal experience of having had foot and mouth syndrome from trying to do this and it failing, um, that, uh, yeah, don't try to, don't try to go at it alone. Um, uh, cause there, you got, you gotta have help. Um, if you're going to try to make a change like that in your organization. Jeremy, I didn't, I never, never thought of you as a troublemaker. <laughs> middle, middle, middle children are troublemakers, man. We got to get the attention of everybody. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I think a, a lot really, I mean, you guys make great points. A lot of this really has to do with just sitting down with people, helping them understand why, what, what, what we're trying to do and why it's important. And once again, taking the emotion out of it. We, you know, if you, anytime that you want to, you want to make a change that's going to help be more proactive and you can bring data to show, hey, listen, when we do it this way, this is what happens. And, and so, um, Jeremy, to your point, I agree with you. You can't you can't be doing stuff. You can't be building shadow organizations within the organization, shadow governments to you know to, to manage things behind the scenes. But there's nothing wrong with doing a little skunk works trial, doing a little A/B testing, right, and going and saying, "Hey, let's try this." And that's one of the things I love about customer success is because you gotta we don't have time to sit around and you know and, and, and analyze everything. Let's try some stuff. Hey, let's try it. Let's try it this way, and let's see what our results are, right? And and so I've got this hypothesis that if we do X, it's going to result in Y. All right. Well, let's go test that. Hey, look, what nice seventy percent, ninety percent of the people we did X with ended up with Y. Then you're able to take that to your boss and say, I have this idea. Here's what we tried. Here's what the results were. And then your boss has an even more powerful message to go to to go to their peer and say here's what we'd like to try and here, or here's what we tried. And this is what the results were. And we'd like you to be part of this, right? Cause we, cause customer success is a team sport. Right? I think that's a really important point, Andrew. Um, you know, in a previous role, you know, obviously in diff- depending on your org, you know, different opportunities or strategies or resources might come to play. And I, I have CSMs like, okay, pick five partners that you want to send this to or 10 partners that you want to do this. And you're like, well, I could send it to everybody. I'm like, 
And you could, but what if you just did it for these five? Let's see how that works out. And, you know, so I think there's a little bit to be said for a bit of AB marketing um, strategy going on. And as well as once again, helping you scale, everybody's not ready for every message at every time. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if it was uh, Jeff or uh, Jay Nathan from um, Gang Grow Retain was posting about that. You know, we invited, uh, you know, Andrew and your team, you guys invited hundreds of people to this webinar. We have a subset that showed up. There's going to always be a time where a message hits or resonates at a different moment when you're ready to hear it. And so that, I think that's another way to think about scaling your work is you don't have to do everything for everybody all the time. And that goes back a bit to that segmentation, but also testing some things, test small, win fast and build on it instead of like, I did this big, huge thing, it failed and I don't know what to do next. Yeah. Yeah. Love yeah. that. Yeah, Good point. Good point. Um, just a reminder, as we're getting to the top of the hour, we are on here until 15 past. So if you can stick around, uh, we are going to continue to answer questions until we get quarter past. Uh, if you cannot stick around, um, the as, as Ashley posted in the chat, uh, we will be posting the uh, replay as well as transcription uh, of this webinar uh, by Tuesday of next week on our website. Uh, let's get to the next question. Amanda, Amanda asks, is there a determining, Amanda, thank you for the, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Keely, thank you for, for the question. And Amanda, thank you for the question. Is there a determining factor on when to switch from reactive to proactive engagement? Our company is highly reactive and feel like proactive engagement would poke the bear while we are working to improve our platform and transition through difficult times related to churn, burn rate, et cetera. Uh, looks like Allie wants to jump in on this one out of the gate. Allie, what have you got for Amanda? Small steps, I would say. <laughs> Small steps. Um, and when you, especially when your company is feeling like they're going to poke the bear because you guys are in that transitional period. Um, you know, you think you have bad data, or you have bad data, and or bad processes. Whatever it might be that you're going through, you can still make proactive steps. In every talk, in every conversation that you are having with your customer, not you know they might be coming at you with questions, you know why is the data looking like this? What about this? This is wrong. You know, kind of going through a forest alone. But there are still some points that if you are, if you're clear on what your customer goals are, it comes back to clarity. If you're clear on what their customer your customer goals are, what your goals are, what the goal of your role is then you can offer small suggestions to help push the pro you know the pro being proactive and then you can also build the co their confidence in you while doing so which will then make it easier to have those difficult conversations when you are going through improvements with your product or anything like that so my real suggestion is every time you're going into a customer meeting is answer their questions as honestly as possible. I think honest, I'm a huge advocate for being honest with your customers, especially, you know, if something's looking bad you can take the emotion out of it. <laughs> Data is take the emotion out of it. Be honest. If something is wrong on your side, as much as, you know, as honest as you can be, and then offer, you know, suggestions for them to get be proactive, just something small in each conversation you have with them. I love that. I love uh, the transparency piece is exactly what I was, I was going to call out, right? If you feel like you're working with your customers and you're running into the same problems, right? The same challenges, whatever it is um, with your customers, we all, we've all been there, right? We're, you are amongst a, a light company in that regard is, is there a way that, right? Maybe the small proactive step is bringing your customers closer to the problems, right? And this, and the solutions to those problems that you, uh, you know, that you're reporting through and, and transitioning, right? If you're talking about, you know, trying to get your hands around churn, right? Or your burn, your, your burn rate of your company or dealing with, you know, a, a large backlog of enhancements and, and bugs with your customers, right? Can you, can you bring your customer in a value added way closer to being the answer to the solution to the things that are going on, right? And that could be, you know, it, it's actually really could be a really big thing to sink your teeth into. But at the same time, it might just be a matter of taking your top five or top 10 customers for your business and inviting them to a conversation with your your executive leadership. I, I hope that's already happening, right? But if that's not happening, right, that may be the 
quote, quote unquote, simple solution to get the customer closer to the solution to the problem, which in, in a lot of cases will then unlock ideas, unlock other solutions that will help you move past the problems that exist because you're bringing the customer in and getting them bought into what the actual solution looks like rather than, you know, doing your, doing these and creating these solutions inside of a, inside of a box, right. That's just focused on you and focused on what you're trying to deliver. So um, that, yeah, I loved what, what Ali said there as well. Well, you should be doing more than just kind of bringing them in to validate the solutions. You should be bringing them in to help you come up with the solutions. Mm -hmm. We want We want to, we always want to introduce the customer into all of our decision-making better yet, Let's introduce the customer into the uh, the solution process. And I'll add to to Ali. I appreciate what you said about those small steps. Yesterday we were talking about this, and when I was preparing last week and getting my mind around proactive versus reactive, and oftentimes we feel like there's this dichotomy between the two, and like I mean, either doing one or the other, and it's like you're always going to be reacting. So Amanda. I guarantee you in your reactive process right now, there are probably five to seven reactions that you're doing over and over again. Identify those five and then figure out how you can, if if it's something that you're dealing with, what's the solution upstream for it? Or how can you create a tool to help mitigate it? So you, you can still, you can build your proactive processes from your most common reactions. So I think, I, I think I said it yesterday is how do we get proactively reactive is yeah. the thing, right? And better at that. So actually we 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 use the term reactive proactivity. I'm, React, I'm or reactive proactivity. <laughs> proactive, right. I'm seeing something in the data, something doesn't feel right. I'm going to proactively reach out to you before you call me. Right. right. So we're reacting or, or I see that for I had 10 customers in the past month where I've done this thing. Well, yeah. what's the what is the solution for that thing you've been doing for those 10 customers that if you did something 30 days early, 60, 60 days earlier, then that outcome is different. Yeah. So you can, is there something we can do farther upstream? Right. Right. So we can still get to where they, they want to get to, but but without some of the pain, maybe. Pain. <laughs> exactly. Uh, awesome. Amanda, thank you for the question. Allie, if you could uh, hit the done button for me. Uh, let's see. Our next question comes from Francis. Francis, thanks for the question. Aside from knowing your customer in their journey, with experience in your specific role and product, do you find that there are similar struggles that customers encounter that could be starting points for identifying challenges that they may encounter? Uh, yeah, I definitely have an answer for this, but Jeremy, you looks like you want to jump in on this yeah. likely answer yeah. the way I am. So go for oh, it. Oh, I, I don't know. We'll see how long this uh, answer is, but uh, I'm going to actually kind of use, I'm going to use a, a story or an example, right? Because uh, I, I usually, when I think about, we talked about segmentation earlier, right? And segmenting, how do I prioritize my customers? But if you look at it, right, let's level it up for a second. And let's actually take the concept of building the customer journey, right? And actually prioritizing, right? Where are the challenge, where are the areas of my customer journey where customers are most likely to encounter challenges, which is kind of, kind of the, if I'm not answering dead on Francis, please feel free to clarify, but like, Thinking about, we all talk about onboarding being the most important part of the customer journey because if they don't onboard, right, they don't implement, they don't adopt in that first, whatever, first 90 days, however long your onboarding cycle is, um, the chances of them coming back and using your product again and again and again and renewing your product is is pretty low, if not zero, right? Unless they encounter you just locked into some like weird political change and all of that type of stuff and they want to like basically start over in the second year of their contract. And so as you think about like, where could, you know, um, possible repeatable encounters and challenges happen in your customer journey, they look backwards, right? I think it's actually fairly easy if you can look backwards and say like, I'm going to isolate on onboarding for a second, but can you look back at your onboarding journey, right? And those who are involved with onboarding your customers, and can you find those things that your your customers over and over and over run into, right? Is it data, getting data integrated into your tool? Or is that a common challenge? Is it the change management piece that Keishla spoke to earlier in our conversation, right? Is it actually getting users to adopt your platform um, and actually use it on an ongoing basis because they would prefer to use their email, right? Or use their calendars or use Slack, right? In place of whatever you're trying to replace, Um, and so that's like, for, for me, that's, and that's what, you know, what we here at Tatango look at and go back and iterate over and over and over again, right? We have a, uh, we have a digital onboarding process that was born out of 
customers wanted to get into our platform and using it faster, uh, right? And we couldn't onboard through live touch fast enough, right? And so we introduced this model of giving customers a different flavor of onboarding for those who, you know, wanted to be able to move at the pace that they could move at. Um, and, and for smaller customers, smaller teams, right, where they aren't pulling as much, right, they don't have as much as organizational change management that they have to navigate through. We're having that human you know, human touch at every single step of the journey matters. And so I think for you, Francis, as you think about what is the thing that you're seeing the most, that's repeating the most. And I, you know, the quickest, easiest way to do that is two things, ask your customers, right? What parts of the journey have they encountered that have been the most difficult? And then ask your teams who are doing those parts of those journeys, right? What are you seeing, right? What is causing us delays? What is causing us to lose time to value, right? And then go and put processes, put people, put technology around those things to make it better and make it more streamlined. Um, and then come back, you know, 60, 90 days later, you know, 30, 60, 90 days later, and go back to those same customers who have encountered those same problems and see if you've actually solved right? What you've seen there. So um, that's kind of my two cents. But Andrew, I, I'm definitely all ears. I would love to hear what you have on this as well. Well, this is why internal data and introspection is super important, right? It's great that we're measuring uh, usage and all these other customer elements, but we should also be measuring if, you know, how long it's taking us to do different things. You know, if we are setting an expectation with the customer to get from point A to point B, we'll take you about 10 days. And Jeremy does it in five days and Allie does it in 12 days. What can we learn from what Jeremy's doing and teach Allie this, right? Yeah. Yeah. While, while customer data is super important, data around and metrics around how we're delivering success is super important. And I, and I like to kind of bucket a lot of that into leading indicators, Right, you've got your leading indicators, you've got your lagging indicators. We should be looking at what it is we're doing to deliver success, but 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 internally, and and I think it's where a lot of customer success vendors sometimes miss the boat. Um, the other thing that I think is super important is by employing tools like Five Whys. When there is a problem, mm. part of the Five Why strategy is for you to peel back the onion and figure out, hey, what how do we get here? And is this something, is there something that we could have done differently to avoid this from happening in the future, right? There are only so many different ways that a customer can utilize your product, utilize your service. There's a finite set of ways. And while each of your customers is different and everybody is special, yada, 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 right? There's only a, there's only a set number of use cases, really, right? I mean, even in a platform play, in, in, when I was doing analytics and business intelligence uh, implementations on a platform where we would have 500 customers with 500 different types of implementations, I could generally group those. And this is how we were able to scale. I could generally group those in different categories. It's the same thing. We need to be able to, you know, when, when things don't go right, we need to spend the time. You need to spend the time to do some root cause analysis and figure out, is this just an anomaly or is this something that we could have prevented, right? And are, have we just been lucky because we haven't had more customers experience it? Francis, thank you for the question. Jeremy, if you could hit done on that, unless, I'm sorry, Kishla or Ali, you had anything to add to that. All right, let's, let's move on. Um, uh, Cole, Cole asks, with the CSM role having people from diverse backgrounds and experiences, once we are in this role and gain the experiences specific to the company, the clients, and the products, what recommendations do you have for certification program courses to further drive our abilities and customer success? <laughs> I should have read that before. Uh, I, of course, I'm going to promote our own uh, program, but uh, if you, you know, feel free to, to, to jump on board on this for, for, for Cole here. I, I knew you had a plant out in the audience. <laughs> Actually, Andrew, so. <laughs> I did not read that before I read it. So, <laughs> full transparency there. Um, I can. I'll put in a little <laughs> bit in the audience. Okay. <laughs> um, so I can answer a little bit of or my thoughts around this. So, I think in customer success, um, a lot of us are always um, forever learners, as we. I mean, call ourselves always looking for more material, more insight and things like that. Um, I think getting your, you have to kind of find an area, um, accept your flaws kind of area. So one of my things is 
right now is really focusing on my communication skills. So then my goal is like LinkedIn learning, communication skills and getting experience or networking with other you know, com- communication professionals that can help me develop skill sets that are going to further my career and customer success. But accepting areas that you know you need to work on and having that inter, you know, what is it, introflection or, you know, self-reflection, knowing that and accepting it will help you decide what certificates or programs or courses you need. And I think what we are in a really great time where CS courses and classes and certifications are just exploding and expanding. And so each one is different. So I'm not saying go and take all of them. Um, I started with Success Hacker. So (laughs) I'm going to be a little bit of a mole out there. And it, I mean, just learning from people that you connect with and you have, you know, you um, see their progress and how they are growing in their conversations and choosing your certifications or your programs based off of the connection and people, your role models really as well. So my suggestion would be to one, really self-reflect on those skills that you feel like you need to work on or ask your leaders, your teammates, Hey, honest opinion, what do you think I need to work on? Or, you know, how do you think I can manage my customers better? Maybe it's project management, maybe it's organization, maybe it's communication and then going into that route. And then also looking at your role models to see what they've done and really research what's interesting to you and then going that route. We call Allie and Allie's one of your role models. So come, come check our stuff out. Uh, and, and actually call, yeah, I'm going to shameless plug, check out our certifications. We are the only globally accredited uh, certification program in customer success. We're also offered uh, at the university level Uh, Our 12-week coaching program is offered under University of San Francisco School of Management, uh, and it's also being offered uh, through uh, uh, Portland State University. So uh, you should check out our our, uh, our, um, courses and certifications at successcoaching.co. Cole, thanks for the question. Let's see. Um, uh, Do we have, we, you know what, we've, we've run out of time here. I have one quick last one from LinkedIn. Um, uh, uh, Let's see. Should from Franklin on LinkedIn, should SDR AEs work alongside a CSM? Real quick, Keisha, yes. you jump in on this out of the gate. Real quick thoughts, and then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up. Yes, customer success is is a extension of the sales process. And and one of the questions that was asked earlier is, are there common problems that all customers uh, deal with, no matter what industry? And it's that. It's that uh, hangover from sales to success and and they saw 50 different platforms or experience and not everybody that you're working with as a stakeholder chose us. So part of customer success as our job is to consolidate the sale, to be able to move that partnership forward. So you should have a really close hand with your SDRs and AEs and make sure that they know how they're properly introducing you. It's not, this is Jeremy, Jeremy's going to get you your account. No, Jeremy's going to help you. He's going to be your everything. no. Make sure that your SDRs and AEs know how to speak about us. We're oftentimes an unwritten line item on contracts, but we provide a great amount of value. And so having a really good connection to your sales team is critical. It's a great point. We, you're typically, <laughs> I, I find over and over again that uh, uh, sales teams don't know how to talk about customer success. And my, my report, them. <laughs> have you explained to them how you work with them, right? Do, what them. you should be doing is, is building, and you should build a slide for their deck. It says, here's, Here's the explanation of what we do and so the handoff, right? So you know, it's a lot of education. So uh, <laughs> anything to add, uh, Ali or Jeremy, before we wrap up? Uh, I 100%, 100% echo everything that Keisha just said, that if you're, if you're your AEs, account managers, um, I, some organizations don't have sales development reps, but your sales counterparts are not close to you. Uh, that is a great, it's a, it's a missed opportunity, but it's also a great opportunity, right? Where you can bring, you know, better customer experience for, for your customers by getting an alignment, um, mm-hmm. there as well. But there's a lot of school of thought around who should own what when it comes to sales and CSM. So oh, that's, that's another not, discussion not for another day. That's a whole, <laughs> whole other day. <laughs> that's a whole, whole other webinar. The most important part right. is that you, you both want to own the success of the customer. And so yeah. figuring out what that looks like, and then you determine who should be doing that is what's most important. Yeah. 100%. Support, right? 
And hopefully it doesn't feel, you mentioned hangover. Hopefully it doesn't feel like hangover. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right. We're at the end of our time uh, that we've got today. I think it was a great conversation, but it's not what I think. It's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your fi- uh, feedback on LinkedIn and tagging either myself, our guests, or success coaching. Also, please make sure to reach out to us on LinkedIn and connect. Uh, uh, we love the success uh, community and, and, uh, and growing it. Uh, I want to thank my amazing panelists for spending the time with us, uh, for our, their ideas, thoughts, insights, and best practices that you shared. One final note, great CSMs know that they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. That's why we created the CSM Mastermind to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. We hope to see you again at our next event on August 24th, when we'll discuss understanding negotiation fundamentals. Until then, make sure to make space for yourself and your mindset every single day and have a great rest of your day, week, and month, everybody.